Sometime between 55 and 58 AD, while he was ministering in the Greek city of Corinth, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to fellow believers in the city of Rome. And the time that he wrote this letter, he hadn't even been to Rome. He may not have even met many of the people that he was writing to, those brothers and sisters in Christ in that church. But though he had never met them, he, he, he told them that they were, they were on his mind. They were in his heart. He'd been praying for them. And he was also praying that the Lord might bring him, give him the opportunity to visit those in that church. So they could fellowship together. They could worship together. So they could encourage one another. A little did Paul know that he would have that opportunity very soon when he was arrested by the Roman government and for preaching the gospel and he was brought into the city of Rome to stand trial before the emperor there. So we're reminded that those believers in that city of Rome were living in a dangerous place. They were living in the imperial capital of the Roman Empire. They were at the center of the most powerful nation in the world at that time. The cultural, the commercial, the political core of the world. And we are told that the estimates are that there was a population of perhaps as many as one million people at that time. What an opportunity. Opportunity for believers there in that city to reach those people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is a well-known saying that all roads lead to Rome. And through the efforts of the construction engineers and the soldiers in the Roman army, that was true to a large extent. In fact, some of those roads were built so well that they survive even to this day. But if it is true that all roads lead to Rome, well, then it is also true that all roads lead away from Rome. And from Rome, many people went out to all the corners of that empire to all the corners of the known world. And who knows where the gospel message would be brought, would be carried by those who had heard it preached in the city of Rome. Technology can be used for good, even Roman roads. But Rome was also a brutal city. It was a wicked city. It was known for its filth, it was known for its sin. It was known for its moral corruption, its perversion. And Paul had attempted to go there several times to encourage those believers. He wanted to go there so that he might minister to those who were surrounded by that evil. But each time, the Lord redirected his steps. So as a result, result of that delay, we have this letter. Sometimes what we perceive as a detour or as a delay is in fact the hand of God leading us, redirecting our steps. And certainly that is true with this letter of Romans. And as we have seen, as we have made our way through the first 11 chapters of this epistle, Paul has carefully defined for us who we were before we knew Christ. He has told us who we are, now that we are in Christ, now that we belong to him. He's made it clear. He's made it precise. And as we shall see as we look at the last five chapters of this letter, he will challenge the believers in Rome, and he will challenge us to live like we belong to Christ. Not an easy assignment in that culture. It certainly is not an easy assignment in our culture today, is it? But Paul reminds us, Paul reminds us that a real relationship with Jesus Christ 
is not only expressed in our words, it's expressed in our lives. It's expressed in how we live. So, the question then, some people ask, is, why did you spend 11 chapters talking about doctrine? Why did he wait to talk about the application of that doctrine? It's a question many people in the church still ask. Why so much attention to this detail? Why do we need to understand doctrine? Well, it is because only those who truly, really understand the truth of what they believe will be motivated to live that truth. And as we're told in 1 Timothy 4, 6, that we are nourished. Our soul is fed by the words of the faith. We are nourished on the sound doctrine which we follow. You get that? We need to know it if we are to live it. So, for 11 chapters, the Apostle Paul has fed us the truth. He has reminded us that we are the called of God. We belong to him. Even if nobody cares about us, even if we're persecuted, hated, and ridiculed because of him, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And lest we forget, Paul very clearly reminds us of the pit from which we came. Whether we were of a Jewish background or whether we were of a Gentile background, we were all guilty of sin. We all fell short of the divine standard of the righteousness of God, and so we stood condemned before the God of the universe. We were unable to help ourselves. We were unable to get right. In the sight of God. And whether we knew it or not, Paul tells us we were on a collision course. We were heading towards an eternity of pain and of punishment. So we were helpless. We were hopeless. But then Paul proclaims the good news that in his great love, in his compassion for us, God has reached down to us and rescued us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to pay for our sins, to die for us, to bring us to God. Though we were enemies, it tells us we were enemies of God. We were enemies because of our rebellion against him. But now in Christ, he says, we have peace with God. We're alive from the dead. We are children of the Most High God. Forever. Forever. And as Paul concludes this 11th chapter, he is overwhelmed by what he has just presented to us. And we should be overwhelmed as well. And so he cries out in amazement. Oh, oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, who can understand the depths of the uncharted waters of the riches of God? Who can understand the spiritual blessings that he has given us in Christ Jesus our Lord? We know in part, we look and see in a mirror dimly. We don't understand everything, do we? We don't understand, so we walk by faith. We stand in awe of our God and we trust that the one who gave his own son for us, even when we were his enemies, will now keep us safe. Now that we belong to him, we are safe. We are secure in Christ. Our portion is blessing upon blessing. It is grace upon grace. Ephesians 1.3 tells us we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Colossians 2.10 says we have been made complete 
in him. And Peter adds in Second Peter 1, 3, he has granted us everything, everything pertaining to life and to godliness. We lack nothing. We have everything in Christ. To him be the glory forever. That should be our cry. That should be the song in our heart. So, now that we know these things, how will we respond to these things? How do we respond? Where do we begin? Well, in the first two verses of Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us where to start. Verse 1, he says, I urge you therefore, brethren, parakaleo in Greek, I come alongside of you. And I, I encourage you. I encourage you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, I beg you, by the mercies of God, oik termos, because of his loving kindness to you. Think of the compassion that he's shown to you. Think of his kindness to you. He sacrificed his own son for us. Remember this, the slate's been wiped clean. There is now no condemnation. We stand in the righteousness of Christ as if we have never even sinned. And so now, the very God of the universe lives within us. We have the assurance of eternal life. We know we will be with him forever. So the question is, why do we still flirt with the things of the world? A world that is rapidly passing away. Why are we so enamored by sin? Why are we so mesmerized by those who are hostile to our Savior? How do we respond to these things? The only response, Paul says, the only response for a true child of God is this. He says, present yourselves, verse 1. Paristemi. Place yourselves. Yield yourselves to the will, to the plan of God for your lives. It is the language that was used to describe the Hebrew priests who would present animal sacrifices to God on the altar. Language that the readers in Paul's day would understand. We're to present ourselves. We're to offer ourselves to God. We're to surrender ourselves to Christ. We're to be consumed by him. Just as Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. So we say, yes, Lord, let your will be done in me. As those who belong to Christ, where do we begin? We begin here, Paul says. He says, start with your bodies. Soma, that which casts a shadow. Our flesh. Start with your flesh. Flesh which is still prone to sin. Remember what Paul said in the sixth chapter of Romans, verse 13? He said, stop presenting the members of your bodies, each part of your body. Don't surrender yourselves to sin. So that sin reigns in us. So the enemy uses us as a weapon of wickedness, as an instrument, as a tool of unrighteousness. But, Paul said, yield yourselves to God. Yield yourselves to his spirit so that he might use the word, the word of God, 
to change us. So we might live with integrity, so that we might live with virtue, so that we might live with uprightness of heart before him and before man, submitting ourselves to God. But we can't climb up on the altar and give ourselves to God. We can't present ourselves before him if we're still living in the gutter. We're still living in the sewer. So Paul instructs us to get out of the gutter. Get out of the sewer. We don't belong there. We belong to Christ. And that's what he wants of us. He wants us. He wants our lives. He wants what already belongs to him. You are not your own, he said in First. Corinthians chapter 16. You have been bought with a price. We have no life of our own. We belong to him. So the question is, what kind of a sacrifice are we? We belong to him. And he wants us to sacrifice ourselves to him. What are we doing? Are we still wallowing in our pride? Still wallowing in our selfishness? Do we still embrace the perspective of this world? Or... Do we really seek to obey him above all else? And when we fail, as we all do at times, do we come to him with a broken heart, weeping, weeping over our sin, weeping because we have failed our Savior again? That is the kind of sacrifice that pleases our Lord. A holy sacrifice, Paul says, hagios, a sacrifice that is set apart unto him. A heart that is seeking to live in undefiled devotion to him. A life that seeks above all else his glory. We might stop for a moment here and ask ourselves a question. Is that really the deepest desire of our heart? Is that what we really want to do? Do we really want to please him above all things? Or are we still seeking to please ourselves? Offering ourselves to God. Placing all that we are before him. Laying our lives on the altar for him. Paul says this is acceptable to God. You arastos in Greek. This is the kind of sacrifice that pleases him. This is a sweet fragrance to him. And someday, we will hear those words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 25, where he said, well done, you arastos. Same word. I am pleased with you. You have been a good and a faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So then it is our privilege to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to our Lord, which Paul notes in verse 1, is your spiritual service of worship. First of all, Paul says it's spiritual. Logikos. Maybe a better word there would be logical. That's what the word means. Obedience is the logical response. It is the spiritual response. It is the response to the grace of God that he has shown to us. It is what makes sense to do, Paul says. It makes sense after all that he has done for us. What else could we do? What else can we do? Paul says, though, it is also worship. Latreia in Greek. Sacred service. It's true worship. Do we want to know what true worship is? Paul says this is true worship. Worship that we offer every minute of every day. And someday, our Lord certainly may say to us, well done. I am pleased with you. I'm pleased that you have offered your life on the altar, sacrificing yourself each day. 
Well, he may be pleased. But please don't expect the rest of the world to be pleased with us. They don't understand. They're incapable of understanding. They have no eyes, no spiritual eyes to see this truth. So it is foolishness to them. In fact, it's too excessive for them. And we might be taken back a little when we see from where the criticism and the opposition comes because of living for Christ. But sometimes it comes even from those who are closest to us, doesn't it? Sometimes it comes from those who claim to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I think it's fair to say that it's a battle, isn't it? It's a real struggle. And sometimes it seems that we are under attack from every side and from every angle. But the real battle does not begin on the outside. It doesn't begin from those around us. We're told that the real battle begins on the inside. The battle begins in our mind. It begins in our thoughts. That's the real battleground. That's the front line. So that's why Paul instructs us in 2 Corinthians 10.5 to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Like a soldier who captures the enemy and takes him prisoner. So we are to capture every thought. And we are to compare it to the truth of the word of God. And if that thought, that perspective, even that image in our mind doesn't line up with the word, we need to get it out of there. We need to change our thinking. And how do we do that? How did Jesus do it? He gave us the way. When he was tempted by the enemy, he used the word of God. That's how we fight the battle. And sometimes... Even doing that can be a battle for us, can it? Sometimes we just can't get those thoughts out of our head. I guess that's the trouble with being a living sacrifice. We keep climbing off the altar. So, in verse 2, Paul gives us some advice. Gives us a command. Really, he gives us a warning to be on guard. Be on guard because we live and we must function in a world and in a culture that is hostile to Christ. And the people of this world have a perspective that is in many times in direct opposition to him. Sometimes, though, because of that, the pressure on us becomes intense, doesn't it? We're expected to to think and to act like everyone else around us. So Paul tells us in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world. Suse matizo in Greek. Stop allowing the thinking of this age, the educational system, the peer pressure, the pressure on the job, the pressure at home, the prevailing attitude of the culture. Stop allowing those things to shape your thinking. Stop allowing them to squeeze you into the mold of the world so that you, who belong to Christ, give the appearance to those around you that you don't even know him. Why? Because you're following the pattern. You're following the schematic of the world. This isn't of God. This is of the enemy. This is of Satan who controls this world. And so it is a disgrace to Christ and is unacceptable to God. But instead, Paul says, verse 2, allow yourself to be transformed. Meta morpho. Let there be a change in you. But change that comes 
not on the outside, change that comes from the inside, comes from the inside out. A change in character, a change in perspective, that will be evident by a change in our behavior. And so then we will be seen for who we really are. We are children of God. We belong to Christ. And the Holy Spirit will use the word of God to keep refining us, to keep changing us, so we might reflect Christ. So how does he do that? Paul says in verse 2, by the renewing, anachinosis, by the reconstruction of your mind. We're under construction. All things are becoming fresh and new. Now we have insight. Now we have understanding that we never had before. Now we have the mind of Christ. Our thought patterns become new thought patterns. And this happens as the Word of God becomes the filter. The filter by which we screen everything. All messages. All input into our mind. Just like we filter water to block out impurities. In the same way, we use the Word of God to filter what we allow into our mind. Isn't that what we were told in Colossians 3.16 where it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you? We are to continually be saturated with his word. This has to be an ongoing process. It has to happen all the time. It, it's kind of like adjusting the focus mechanism, the dial on a pair of binoculars. We want to see clearly? What do we do? We turn the dial. In the same way, we adjust our thinking. We adjust our thinking until it is clear and strong and our thoughts have been brought into line with the Word of God. And when our thinking goes out of focus, and it easily goes out of focus, doesn't it? What are we to do? Dial it back in again. Keep adjusting our thinking until we reflect the Word of God, until we reflect Christ. So as our mind is being renewed, as we are being transformed, amazingly, we're able to discern the truth. We have spiritual insight. We have understanding. Paul says, yes, so you may prove, dokimatso. So you are able to examine and to assess all things that come your way. To even understand, he says, what the will of God is. Thelema. His choices, his commandments, his desires for us. Those things, Paul says, which are good, agathos, which are excellent, beyond good. That which is acceptable, again, euarestos, an acceptable sacrifice. We will be an acceptable sacrifice. And he says we will be made perfect. A perfect sacrifice. Teleos, a complete sacrifice. Complete in him. So that nothing more is needed. So that we do what he wants us to do. So that we are who he wants us to be. Living on the altar. Surrendered to him. Living for the glory of his name. For Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is the one who offered himself up so that we might have life, and so that we might offer ourselves, so that we might commit ourselves, our lives, to him forever. Amen.
You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.